be here, thank you. Let me introduce our speaker for this afternoon. Craig Benham received his PhD in 1972 from Princeton. He became interested in protein structure problems while an assistant professor at Notre Dame, after which he spent a year working as a postdoc in the biology division at Caltech. A few of his recent papers include the theory of DNA superhelicity, writhing and linking densities for closed circular DNA, and my personal favorite of chicken teeth and mouse eyes, or generalized character compatibility. He's a member of the mathematics faculty, the biomedical engineering graduate group, and the genome center at UC Davis. Before coming to UC Davis, he held positions at the University of Notre Dame, Lawrence University, the University of Kentucky, and the Mount Sinai School of Medicine. His research group at UC Davis has developed statistical mechanical methods to analyze computationally the occurrence of structural transitions in stressed DNA molecules. I'm very pleased he was able to speak with us today. Please join me in welcoming Professor Benham. Well, thank you, Abby. I appreciate being here. Uh, as I was telling Abby before, I, uh, I went to a very similar program myself when I was in, uh, oh yes, sorry, when I was in high school many, many years ago, and it really set the course of my career. Uh, I think these programs are wonderful and very important, and I hope you're all really enjoying it. Uh, the program I went to was in a single field at the time. Uh, unlike this, where there are uh, clusters who are working in any of perhaps 10 different areas. Uh, I wanted to talk today about uh, DNA, which is, as you can tell, my first love, uh, scientific love. And, uh, but I wanted to give you, show you a problem, an area where uh, a lot of the fields that you're, you're studying separately come together. I mean, it's natural when you need to learn physics to learn physics, chemistry to learn chemistry, biology to learn biology. But when you get out into the real world of scientific research, it quite often happens that a particular problem need, has aspects that are biological, aspects that are chemical, aspects that are physical, aspects that, where you need mathematics to understand them. So all of these things in real world problems very often come together. And I wanted to talk today uh, to give you an example of this. So the mathematics that uh, the DNA uh, uses is called topology. Uh, I'm going to give you a little uh, introduction to what that means uh, and what it is as it's relevant to DNA. Um, and then I'm going to talk about how DNA uses topology to do the various jobs that it does. And I hope I'll be able to end with a, uh, a particular example of this. Uh, I want this talk to be relatively non-technical. Uh, and also I want to, you to see where all these different scientific areas contribute uh, to it. But if there are any questions or problems, don't hesitate to raise your hand. OK, so topology is basically it's the study of the properties of shapes that don't change when you change the shape. Uh, that is, you can continuously deform this coffee cup into a donut. Uh, the shape of a donut or the shape of a coffee cup is its geometry. The topology that doesn't change is basically that it has this handle uh, which stays there no matter uh, what you do. So as long as you're continuously deforming something, you're not changing the topology. Uh, now, what we're going to be working with is DNA, which is a molecule that's a linear molecule. So we're going to be interested in linear things mostly. Uh, so here is a straight line, and here is a deformed version of the straight line. These two, of course, have the same topology. To get from this one to that one, you just continuously deform it like a like a belt, a line segment, you know, no matter what I do to it, it's still got the topology of a line segment. And the essential thing that doesn't change is that it got, it's got two ends. This is different than the topology of a circle. See, at these ends, 
any, at any interior point, there are points the, on either side of that point. At the ends, there's only points in one side, but not the other. And similarly for that end. But for all of these points, there's a point on either side of them. So it doesn't have ends. Uh, and these two are topologically different. The things that are forbidden are you cannot cut something. That's a discontinuous change. You cannot glue two things together. I cannot glue the ends of these two, these two points together to make sort of one point out of the two. Uh, and, because that's a discontinuous change. But anything that I want to do, wrap it up and snarl it up as much as I want, uh, preserves the topology. And for instance, if I close this, then it's the same deal. I can just wrap it and snarl it, but it's still, whatever the geometric shape is, it has the topological structure of a circle. Okay. So, knots. When you think of a knot, you informally think of, you know, tying a knot in your shoe or something like this. That, from the point of view of a mathematician, is not a knot because I made it by a continuous deformation of this line and I can get rid of it by a continuous deformation and it's just still the same line. But, to make it a topological thing, if I close it up, so that now it's a knot in a closed loop, then that knot is stuck. There it is. There's nothing I can do to get rid of it. I can pull it tight. I can move it around. I can mess with it all kinds of different ways so it's not apparent that it's a knot. But it still is. It still has this knot in it. So this knot is a topological thing once it is in a closed circle. Okay? And there are lots of different knots. There are whole tables of them. Uh, these are the, the one that I put in here is the simplest of them, a trefoil knot. Uh, this is a granny knot. There are tons and tons of others. Uh, the uh, cousin to a knot is, is, is what's called a link. Uh, to make a link, you need two closed circles. And the, they can link through each other in a variety of ways. Uh, this sort of thing is also a, uh, a topological uh, property. As long as the two are closed, you cannot unlink these unless you cut one and allow it to pass through the other and then close it up on the other side. So that takes, that's a discontinuous change, so that's not permitted. So these guys are going to stay linked no matter how you mess with their geometry. And again, as with knots, so with links, there are tons and tons of different ones. There are tons of different ways you can interlink two circles. And these are topologically, each of them, distinct. Uh, this is a very uh, wonderful field to study as a, as a field of mathematics. In some ways, it's quite intuitive. In some ways, it's very hands-on. And in some ways, it's very abstract and uses a lot of tools of abstract mathematics. So it's a, it's a wonderful first introduction to abstract mathematics. Now, in topology, one of the things that people do is they find invariance. Some number that doesn't change as long as the topology stays the same. And the linking number is one of them. It's the one that's relevant to this talk. Uh, the linking number tells you the number of times one closed circle links through the other. So in this case, uh, if you follow the blue circle, it links from below to above th through the red circle. And you, and you call that, a, you give that a plus one. And if it linked the other way, you could give it a minus one. Uh, here, the blue circle links from below to above there, and then again from below to above there, linking through the red circle. This piece is outside the red circle, so it doesn't contribute. So it's only linking from below to above through the red circle that matters. So this guy has linking number two. Okay. And it turns out that you can show that uh, the linking number is a topological invariant. No matter what, how you change the geometry of this, whatever structure you, you have will still have a linking number two. Uh, and there are a lot of other ways to calculate linking numbers. I just want to give you an understanding of kind of what they mean and a simple way to visualize them. So for example, 
with this guy, this belt has a, has a white side and a black side so we, can, so we don't get confused. So I'd make a one turn and two turns and now I can close it up. And now if you think about the two edges of the belt as being the two circles that are interlinked, you can see that there are two full turns there so one edge is linking through the other one twice. Either one you look at, it's linking through the other one twice. Can people see these things? Okay, good, good. So this has linking number two. But again, you know, it has all kinds of different geometries it can go into. But it still always has linking number two. And it's unknotted. Okay, so this one, again, the blue goes through the red from below to above there once, and there once, and there once, and there once. And so this one has linking number four. And this, I hope, is starting to look a little like DNA. So, let me uh, take a moment and talk about DNA. So we'll go, from the, we'll go from the mathematics to the biology here for a moment. Uh, DNA structure this is the sort of standard structure of DNA, but DNA structure is basically, there are two strands, a red strand and a blue strand, just to keep them separate you know, in your mind. Uh, they are held together by weak bonds. These little dashed lines here are hydrogen bonds. They are weak bonds. They're basically electrostatic associations that opposite charges attract. Uh, so they're not, they're not hard chemical bonds, not covalent bonds. They're just, so you can, you can easily separate these two strands uh, by just pulling apart these, these weak bonds. Uh, each strand consists of a linear array of repeated objects. Uh, the objects are a base, which has some nitrogens in it, uh, and a sugar. Uh, in this case, the sugar is deoxyribose, but that doesn't matter. Uh, and a phosphate group. Uh, the phosphate groups link two sugars. So the, the, the one, one piece is connected to the next by the phosphate group. So it's a base, a sugar, and the phosphate group. Now the, sh the sugar has a, uh, this, the, the carbons are numbered one, two, three, four, and five. So the sugar, the, the sugar connects through its five prime carbon it connects to one phosphate. Through its three prime carbon, it connects to the other phosphate. So there's a five prime to three prime chemical direction that goes up and is preserved in this. Now, all this is kind of for the chemists, but uh, the point for everybody else is just that there is a directionality to this which gives an arrow to the directionality of the, of the strand of the DNA and that the other strand has the opposite directionality, the five prime end. Here, this sugar, this is the five prime carbon, this is the three prime carbon. So five prime to three prime is down in this one. So that one is going down and this guy's going up. Okay? Uh, the, uh, the thing that people most associate with DNA is that it's a, it has a base sequence. That is, these bases can be any of four things, call them A, C, T, or G. Uh, and they uh, uh, and they they base pair across the, the bases on one strand pair with the bases on the other, and it's always C with G or A with T. Okay. So each strand contains the information to make the other strand. If you if you take away the blue strand and you just have the red strand left, you can make the blue strand again by you know, well here's a T, so I have to put an A across from it. Here's a G, they have to put a C across from it. There's an A, so I need a T over there. Here's a C, so I put a G over there. So each one of them contains the information to make the to make the whole molecule. Uh, and also, of course, as you go along the DNA, you read there's a sequence of bases, and that's how the genetic information is contained. And then, of course, at the end, the whole thing is arranged as a helix. Okay. Now, the topology comes in because DNA also initially came in because DNA also was found to be occurring as a circle. Uh, and uh, this one shows it best. These are the original um, 
um, electron microscope pictures from the original uh, paper that, that discovered this, which was 10 years after the double helix by Watson and Crick was uh, published. Uh, so now we have a circular molecule that has a linking number because it's closed circular. And again, the red strand closes on the red strand, the blue strand closes on the blue strand because they have opposite orientations. They can only close on themselves. So you get the topology of two interlinked circles. And so that's what DNA is. However, with DNA, you can, it's generally a fairly long molecule. So when you close it into a circle, you can close it with various linking numbers. I could close, you know, if this were a sort of an analog of DNA, its unstressed shape is untwisted, whereas DNA has a certain twist to it. So I can close it with that shape, and I get a sort of a relaxed structure that just, it, it's, it's as relaxed as it feels like it can be. Or I can close it with a different linking number. I can put in a linking number of one, or a linking number of two, or any linking number I want. And the more link I put in, the more snarled up the DNA becomes. I'll explain a bit about that in, in a little while. But if you put in a linking number that is different than the relaxed value, then the DNA tends to have to snarl up one way or another. It, it tends to form these structures called supercoils. Uh, I'm sorry, this is a jargon word. I want to try to avoid jargon words, but it's, it's, a, it's a level of coiling where the whole double helix is coiling on itself. So it's a level of coiling above the coiling of the double helix itself uh, of one strand around the other. And that's why it's supercoiling, because it's a higher level of coiling. Okay. And what makes this useful uh, is that, first of all, you can see these as things become more, this is a relaxed molecule. As it becomes more supercoiled, it gets more tightly snarled up. And actually, more importantly, you can, there are ways of separating these things uh, um, chemically. Uh, so DNA is an acid. And an acid is a molecule that has an absent-minded hydrogen on it that will, in solution, go wandering off as a free proton, taking a positive charge away and leaving a negative charge on the rest of the molecule. So DNA under solution conditions will have a charge to it. So if you put it in a, an electrical gradient, it will run away from the negative pole and run towards the positive pole. So it will migrate in this direction. So what this is, is a gel. It's like jello. It's a slab of gel. It's not made of gelatin. It's made of something else. But you put the DNA, your, your sample, in, a lane, in on top, and then you just run a, an electric field, and it runs down the electric field. Uh, these are all molecules that are identical. They only differ in linking number. They have the same base sequence, the same everything, just the same length. Uh, they just differ in linking number, and if you get your gel conditions right, you can sort them out by linking number. So this, so this band differ, differs from that one by one in the linking number. And then you can take your little scissors and you can cut this band out, and you have a sample of DNA that is homogeneous in linking number. Every molecule has the same linking number. So you can do all kinds of experiments on it. Again, this is sort of the basic uh, physical chemistry, uh, a physical chemistry aspect of what I'm talking about here. Okay, now the linking number is a controlled quantity. Um, the, um, it's a topological invariant, so as long as you don't change the topology, the linking number is the same. So if you want to change the linking number, you have to either cut or glue. You have to do one of these forbidden operations on the molecule. And there are a lot of enzymes, which are little molecular machines that do specific jobs, that do these sorts of things. This is one that's called DNA gyrase. Uh, this, this, there's a T segment and a G segment here. These are both the double helix. Don't be confused. These are not the two strands of one double helix. This is a double helix, and this is a separate double helix. It's like, you know, over here and over there. On, on this belt. And so what this, what this enzyme does is it grabs this G strand and the T strand and it cuts the G strand and it pushes the T strand through it and then it closes it up again. So it does a double strand passage. Now, let me do that with, with this so you can see what happens. If you, if you start out with this thing relaxed and now I'm gonna just, I'm gonna just 
uh, push something through this. Uh, the see, these are not really together, so I can push something through the through the gap between them. So I'll just take this thing and push it through the gap and close it up. And it has linking number two. See, two full turns. So every time you do a double, a double strand passage like this, you change the linking number by two. So there are enzymes whose function is to regulate the linking number of DNA. Okay? Now, these can do a bunch of other things too in terms of the topology. Uh, if you have an unknot, uh, something that is not knotted, a closed circle that's not knotted is called an unknot in mathematics. Then you can push it around to get any geometry you want. All of these are still unknots. But now if you do a strand passage so that you take the one that's behind and you push it so now it's in front, then you can turn it into a trefoil. Or if you have a trefoil knot and you do a strand passage at any one of these three, then you can, then you will unknot it. Okay? So the gyrase can change the knot type. It can knot and unknot DNA also. And again, in, in all of these, this, this rod-like thing is the double helix itself. And again, it can link and unlink. If you have two, uh, two DNAs that are linked together, then by a strand passage, you can unlink them. And this is actually thought to be one of the major uh, jobs of gyrase in the cell. But it can do all three of these jobs. And the other major job is that it controls the linking number. And that's the one that we're going to be focused on uh, today. Now, OK, so that's some biology and some mathematics of the, uh, the linking. Uh, now a little bit of physics or physical chemistry. So DNA looks like a spring, and actually it behaves like a spring. It's got an unstressed twist rate. But you can, you can crank it up, or you can untwist it. Those, those deformations require energy. It wants to be approximately straight, but you can bend it, and that requires energy too. So it's like a spring. You can make all kinds of deformations of it, but it requires a bending energy to bend it and a twisting energy to twist it, and this is kind of its lowest energy shape that it wants to be. So now you can do mechanics. You can do uh, uh, engineering with this molecule. And so basically, uh, a supercoiled structure like this guy um, has a uh, higher energy than a relaxed structure because there's more bending involved here. Uh, you can see that it would be a higher energy. So here's a nice problem uh, in uh, basically uh, molecular engineering. So you have a DNA molecule that's circular. It's closed with a fixed linking number, whatever it may be. I'll put in a linking number of two here just for the sake of argument. And the question is, what are, and now you have this molecule that is now elastic. It takes energy to bend and energy to twist. And it does take some energy to bend and twist this, this belt. It's not terribly elastic, but it's sort of enough for the purpose of illustration. Uh, and, uh, and so the question is now you've got a fixed linking number on something that can elastically deform, that requires energy to deform. So what kind of equilibrium configurations can it take on? And so that's a physics problem, or if you wish, a, uh, an engineering problem. Uh, it's been solved. And the answers are that it takes on structures that are, these are the e stable equilibrium configurations as you change the linking number. Uh, in this particular instance, you need to think of, I mean, what they're really doing is they're taking a molecule, and at the ends, they're putting in a little dial, and they're twisting this one relative to that one, so that when it gets to an integer, then you can close it, and it's a real linking number. But as long as you are just sort of thinking of this as something where you can dial in a parameter, a twist parameter here, then you can change the linking number effectively continuously. And that's what they're doing in this case. OK, DNA has another trick. Back to some, back to some chemistry and, and uh, uh, physical chemistry. Any base pairs that form can separate. Now, you remember the AT base pairs had two hydrogen bonds and the GC base pairs had three. 
Well, partly because of that and partly because of other reasons, it's easier to separate the AT base pairs than the GC ones. But nevertheless, anything that can form can separate. And the, the energy that it takes to do that is going to depend on what the base pairs are that you're trying to separate. Now, this is a critical function for DNA. Uh, DNA has two basic jobs. It needs to express genes. And to do that, what happens is that you have this complex, it's called a polymerase, which runs around and it takes, it makes a messenger RNA, which is the red thing here, with the sequence that's complementary to one strand of the DNA. And the other strand has to get out of the way to allow this process to happen. So in order to initiate this process, you have to, you have to make a bubble where the DNA is strand separated. The other major job of DNA is that every time cells divide, they have to get a complete set of genetic instructions. So the whole of the, every chromosome has to make a copy of itself, and the copies have to segregate to the daughter cell. So every cell division, the DNA has to make copies of itself. Now, each strand has the information to synthesize the complementary strand, so all you do is separate the strand, separate the two, and then each one serves as a template for making the other strand, and there you are. That's basically how replication happens. But again, to initiate this, you have to pull the strands apart. So both of the major jobs of DNA require bubbles of strand opening to happen. So where and when these strand separations occur is very, very carefully controlled in biology. Now, back to the topology, how this can happen, uh, how topology can drive this process. So here's a situation where you have a molecule that has 36 turns of DNA, their number, this is 35, and that's thir the last one is 36, and, they, uh, and, and it's closed with a linking number of 32. So there are four of these supercoils negative supercoils in this molecule. And this is a highly bent structure. It requires a fair amount of energy to form. There's another way, though, that you can package the thing with the same linking number. What you could do is that you could just open four turns of the double helix. So now you have a strand-separated region of four turns. So you have 32 turns that are still double helix. And the linking number is 32. So everything's fine, there's no, re there's no uh, residual deformation like this, okay? So these are two ways that you can package the same DNA with the same linking number. And of course, you could do intermediates between these. You could open less and have some fraction of supercoils happening too. But these are just illustrations of the way that this can behave. Now, the, there's a cost to this transition. There, it, it costs energy to open these base pairs. But on the other hand, you get a benefit, too, because you're relaxing the high energy of this highly deformed um, um, curved structure. So if the benefit exceeds the cost, then this will be the structure that will be preferred. And in that way, a deficiency of the linking number, that it's only 32, whereas to be relaxed it would have to be 36, can drive structural transitions which can be involved with opening the DNA and giving access so that genes can express, so that replication can start. All these things can happen. And it's dr driven in some measure by the topology, what the linking number is. Okay, now back to some physics. Uh, you can calculate these things. Uh, you can, you can uh, take a DNA of thousands of base pairs long, put on any linking number you want. So now this is a molecule whose actual linking number is less than its relaxed value by 29 turns. It's under twisted by 29 turns. If I made it, you know, into something like this, it would have 29 turns instead of two. Uh, and you can calculate what's the probability of, of strand separation of every base pair in it and get results like this. And the, uh, the answers are actually quite good. When you do experiments to measure it, the open regions are experimentally found to be there and there, which is exactly where the uh, theory calculates them to be. So uh, again, this is physics. It's statistical mechanics. I'm not going to go into it, but uh, just beyond just saying that this is a calculation also that one can do. OK, back to DNA structure. Uh, this is not the only thing 
that DNA can do, the strand separation. It can also go into a left-handed helix. This is, uh, you see this is winding in a left-handed way. Uh, the handedness of a helix, uh, you can see this as left-handed, as, as it, you can see this strand as going from back to front, back to front, and going to the left. Okay, and this is my left hand. So that makes it left-handed. Uh, so you have right-handed helix, so the normal B form is a right-handed helix. This is a left-handed helix. Uh, and it requires a certain base sequence to form. It doesn't form in every sequence, but it's another thing that DNA can do. DNA has a surprising number of different types of structures it can have. Uh, this is a cruciform. In this, you see this particular strand goes up and back down. So this is a strand that is base pairing with itself. Now, in order to do that, you know, because A's pair with T and G with C, there's got to be symmetry to the, to the sequence along this. So there are symmetric requirements, symmetry requirements, uh, that permit a cruciform like this to happen. Um, this structure, in order to go, for, uh, this strand separated region, it's going from, a, you know, the helicity of a double helix to untwisted. So it's changing the twist. This guy, if you drive a transition to this structure, you're going from right-handed to left-handed. So you're doing more than just untwisting it, you're twisting it in the opposite direction. This one is also untwisted. There's, there's, this strand is a Watson-Crick structure, but it's, it's base pairing with itself. It's not twisting around the other strand. So the, 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 the helical twist is actually zero for this. So both of these, so this one is kind of like this, that there's, that, that when you, when you do the, when you put the DNA into this structure, you are untwisting the double helix. And so the same considerations of going from a highly supercoiled, highly energetic one to a more relaxed DNA with this alternate structure in it, the same considerations, the same analysis happens for all of these types of transitions. And they have base uh, sequence requirements f to form. So uh, you can also analyze these competitive transitions. And they are competitive, you see, because if, uh, if one transition happens, one, if you have a molecule that can have different things happening in different places, and you put on some undertwist, then say it strands separate here, well, that packages the undertwist as that strand opening, and like, like that slide show, showed, it, it allows the rest of the sequence to relax somewhat. And so that means that the other transitions are less likely to happen, that every base pair sees what any other base pair is doing. So these are competitive transitions. So this is a, this is a sample calculation we did. I thought I'd show you it, because it and explain it because it was on the on the poster for this talk. Uh, but this is an artificial sequence that has one region that's susceptible to strand opening, one very AT rich region, one region that's susceptible to Z form transition, and one region that's susceptible to cruciform. And then this is the linking difference. This is the actual linking number. And the, the actual linking number is here. The relaxed linking number is there. If the actual one is smaller than the relaxed one, so the whole thing is under twisted, then this is a positive number, and this is the fraction of the relaxed linking number that, by which it's undertwisted. So this is sort of a fractional undertwist, is this, is this number. So we looked at this for different cruciform sizes, and what we found is that, and, and, and this is as you, as you supercoil this molecule more and more, as you change its topology by changing the linking number. So first of all, now, oh yeah, I should explain this. So cruciform transitions are green. Melting, which is strand separation, is red. ZDNA, a little hard to read here, is blue. If you have the ZDNA and the melting going both, then you get this magenta. If you have melting and cruciform both, then you get yellow. If you have ZDNA and cruciform, then you get this teal green. Uh, and if you have all three happening, then you get white. Okay, so if you start out with a short cruciform, then first of all, there's nothing. At a certain stress level, uh, in this particular example, the ZDNA transforms. So now you have, at, at stress levels in that, rate, in that range, now you have only ZDNA. And then a curious thing happens. So now you have this molecule and a, a ZDNA has popped out here. 
if you stress it more, a curious thing happens. The ZDNA falls back and the molecules and the strand separation happens. So you can get coordinated reversions and, and, and transitions where, where the ZDNA reverting back to B form is coupled to the melting of a separate region at a different part of the molecule. And then if you stress it even more, then the Z region comes back and you have them both happening, the melting in the Z simultaneously. Now if the, and that goes on and on, and if the, if the cruciform is short, then it doesn't play in any role at all. If the cruciform's a little longer, then eventually the cruciform also forms uh, when you get stressed beyond a certain amount, and now you have all three transitions happening. If the cruciform is still longer, then suddenly it changes, the, cha the behavior changes, and suddenly the first thing that happens is this cruciform forms, and then you get the cruciform and the, and then you get the same pattern here. You get the cruciform and the Z form, there, both of them, and then the Z falls back to, to uh, uh, B form, and, and you get the cruciform and melting. That's the yellow. And then beyond that, you get all three. So there's a very intricate dance that happens with the DNA with these structural transitions happening here and there and everywhere and you know, reversions here coupled to transitions there. It's a very dynamic process, a very dynamic dance. Uh, and I don't want to go into this in too much detail, but when we analyzed 14,000 human genes at the stress levels that they occur in, in living cells, every single one of them had regions of alternate structure in them. These, these regions of alternate structure are basically universal at the stress levels that we have. Now, so far we've only talked about circles of DNA, and that sounds like a very specialized kind of thing to do. But in fact, this topological constraint is basically uh, universal. Um, bacterial uh, chromosomes usually are circular, but they are divided up into smaller domains by being held at the base. Uh, the uh, chromosomes of higher organisms, like ourselves, also are held in a sequence of loops. Now, that is actually the same constraint as, as the constraint of, of circularity. It's effectively the same thing. I mean, if I put in, uh, let me do it this way. If I put in, say, two turns, linking number of two here, again, okay? That constraint is the same, and it's really circular, as if I just turn this around and hold it at the base. It's the same thing, it's still got the same linking number. It's entirely the same. As long as I hold it so it can't twist at the base, then the constraint on a loop is topologically equivalent to the constraint of being circular. And all I would have to do to go from one to the other in this example is just pop it around and close it. Okay? But what's basically happening is exactly the same. So this, this constraint, this topological constraint, happens in all DNA all the time, in every cell, in every organism. Okay. Now, there's another way in which the, um, the topology can be, in some sense, uh, uh, changed. I, I talked about these, m these enzymes, such as gyrase, that do strand passages and change the topology. But there's another way in which this can effectively happen, which is that when, you, when the DNA, when the genes are expressing, they're expressing by this polymerase moving along and making an RNA. Uh, remember that. So, so uh, but what happens is that as this um, complex pushes along, it pushes over twist ahead and it leaves under twist behind. Uh, so, for example, in this case, I don't know whether you'll be able to see this. So, if I put in a turn here, and then I start doing something that involves strand separating, so that the so that the downstairs piece is untwisted, what I'm effectively doing as I creep along is I'm pushing the twist into the upstairs piece, and it's getting higher and higher twist on it, and the downstairs one is relaxed. So you can think of this two ways. This is sort of like a moving domain boundary between a highly stressed region and, a, and, an, and, an, and an unstressed region, or you can think of it as just repartitioning the, the twist to the, 
region it's not yet gotten to. But this is basically what the uh, polymerase is doing. Now, yeah, this is just another slide that sort of shows it, that, that what's happening is that downstream from the polymerase, the region it's already passed through is strand separated still, and so it's, it's untwisted relative to the upper region. So it's pushing over twist ahead and leaving a wake of under twist behind it. Okay, so I want to tell you a story, a biological story uh, in the end uh, that kind of puts all of this together so that you can see how it plays out. Uh, this is a story about the C-MYC gene. Uh, C-MYC is a particular uh, gene. It makes a protein called the C-MYC protein, which is something called a growth factor. So it affects how cells grow. And it's a very important um, um, gene in, in uh, mammalian biology. It's, an, it's called an oncogene. Onco means cancer. Uh, and it's, oncogenes are genes where when you misregulate them, they cause cancer. Uh, this particular one, C-MYC, uh, causes a cancer called Burkitt's lymphoma, and it's also involved in a whole bunch of other types of cancer. Uh, the semic protein that this gene makes, uh, like I say, it's a growth factor. If you get too much of it in the cell, then the cell grows in an uncontrolled way, and that's the cancer. If you get too little of it in the cell, then the cell stops growing, and it senesces, and eventually it will die. So you have to get this just right, you know, not too hot, not too cold, not, not, not too much of this protein, not too little of this protein. It has to be just at the right concentration and maintained at the right concentration within a factor of about four or five uh, all the time. Now, for reasons that uh, you, I uh, can't explain and one doesn't really look for explanations in biology, uh, this semic protein is rapidly degraded. So, in fact, as it's made, it, it has a short half-life in the cell. So how much it is there, the abundance of it, is primarily determined by how much it is expressed. So the rate at which its gene is expressed is the determining factor, the major controller for how much of this stuff is, is in the cell. And it has to be regulated rather carefully that way. So these P's are the various sites. These three are the major sites where this gene expression starts, OK? Now remember that as it expresses, it pushes over twist ahead, and it leaves a wake of under twist behind it. Now there are these various regions, Z1, Z2, Z3, and in particular this fuse region. This is called fuse far upstream sequence element. That's why it's called fuse. It's uh, about 150, uh, sorry, it's about uh, uh, 1,500 base pairs upstream. These, these, these little uh, marks are 500 base pairs apart. Uh, so it's about 1,500 base pairs upstream from where the gene tends to start, okay? And it is a region that easily strand separates. So when the, when the transcription, when, sorry, when the gene expression, when the polymerase moving along pushes under twist behind, it opens this region. It causes it to strand separate. Now, the way it does it is actually bimodal. Uh, this is the linking difference uh, at going from minus 12 to minus 20. Uh, and, uh, um, well, expressed this way, it's from 12 to 20 because the actual linking number is smaller than the relaxed value by that much. And you find that one region opens very quickly and the other region opens relatively slowly. So one region opens at relatively lower stress levels, the other region opens at higher stress levels. So an early melting region and a late melting region. Now, there's a protein that binds to this fuse element. And that protein regulates the next round of transcription. When it binds to the early melting region, and it only, this, this protein, I should say, only binds to single-stranded DNA. If the DNA is in a duplex, it cannot bind. If the DNA wants to go back from single-stranded to duplex, the protein falls off. Okay. So this protein binds to the strand-separated piece of the DNA. When it binds to the early melting region, 
it initiates the next round of transcription. When it binds to the late melting region, it inhibits the next round of transcription. So binding only here, that will cause another round of transcription to start. Binding here will cause it to not start. It will prevent it from starting. And if it binds to both, which commonly happens, then the inhibition dominates. Okay, so the late melting region dominates over the early melting one. Okay, so what happens is this. This gene starts expressing. It pumps negative supercoils back, under twist back. It causes this region to become more stressed. It, it causes it to have a smaller linking number. And that causes the late melting region to open. And then the protein binds to the late melting region, and it inhibits the next round of transcription. The uh, next round of gene expression, sorry. Uh, and so the, the gene expression, the polymerase, pushes along and along and along. And it's pushing negative supercoils, negative twist back the whole time. But eventually it gets beyond this point. And at that point, now it's pushing negative supercoils, it's pushing under twist back here. And now this is do, performing another transition. The negative supercoils are going to driving a different transition. So they don't get past this point to keep the fuse element open. So the negative supercoils that are, that are over here, now they're, you know, this is a dynamic process. These are like waves of twist passing down the DNA. The waves that were here are, you know, they pass along and the DNA becomes progressively relaxed. Whereas the waves that are being produced now by the polymerase are going to opening this, to causing a structural transition in this region. So this one relaxes somewhat. And that means that the late melting region falls back to B form, turns back to B form and the um, protein ceases to bind to that region, leaving it only bound to the early melting region, and that activates the next round of transcription. So this whole thing is a gate. It's a topological gate, is what it is. That, so you start a round of transcription, and by the, by the structural transition 1,500 base pairs away, you inhibit the next round of transcription until the last one has gotten past here and gotten past it far enough so that this guy has fallen back enough so that the next round runs. So, this, this, so, so once the polymerase gets perhaps up to about here, then the next round happens. And so you get rounds of transcription, rounds of gene expression, one after another after another, paced, gated, by this particular specific distance. And that is how this gene is regulated so that it expresses just at the level it needs, not too much, not too little, to make just the right amount of the semic protein to keep everything right for the, for the cell. And it's a, it's a topological gate. It's determined by the linking characteristics of this, of this particular region. And it's determined by, it's, it's, it involves waves of under twist that pass down the DNA, structural transitions that happen in the DNA, uh, and uh, uh, it's a very, very active process. So this view of DNA that I want the biologists to, in the group especially to bring back is that it's a highly dynamic molecule and it really actively participates and the mechanisms by which it's regulated. It's topologically constrained, and the level of the topological constraint, the linking number, is closely regulated by a bunch of processes. Uh, and, and its activities deter are determined by how topologically, uh, what its topology is, how it's stressed by the topology. Uh, and uh, as genes express, there's waves of twist that pass down the molecule. These can drive structural transitions, which can affect uh, regulation and mechanisms of, of regulation in a variety of ways. The one I showed is only one that involved the binding of, of uh, a protein to, the, to these alternate structures. But there are many other ways that these things uh, can and do happen. Uh, and of course, these things can be modulated by a variety of events. So for example, one thing that I didn't talk about, if you have this DNA and it's got these twist waves driving down it dynamically, as long as the DNA is fairly straight, you know, it can, it can twist. But if you bind a protein to it that binds and bends the DNA, suddenly the twist up here gets transformed into a pulling this big lever arm through a solvent, a solution which is very 
viscous at this size scale. And so suddenly everything changes. The, 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 the uh, stress won't be able to get down beyond this point very far. And, uh, and, and so suddenly the, all the constraints change. So you need to think about DNA as a very active, very dynamic molecule with all kinds of, of ways in which, in which uh, binding events and structural transitions can affect its activity. It's a very different picture than the sort of passive view of DNA that, uh, that people have. So this is a picture in the end that kind of brings everything together. But I, want you, I wanted to show you an example of how, especially in biology, especially in modern biology, you need to understand mathematics, you need to understand physics, you need to understand chemistry to understand these biological processes. And these, although, like I say, at certain stages in one's education, one studies these things as separate disciplines. In fact, in the real world, they come together and merge together, and you need them all to understand a lot of the things that happen uh, in, in living systems especially. So, well, thank you. In this, this, this fuse, um, one of the things that makes biology very difficult is that every story is its own story. Uh, this fuse element is something that is specific to the CMYC gene. Uh, there are many, many other uh, stories where uh, structural transitions play roles in regulation. But it's very difficult to actually tease out the details at this level of what's actually happening biologically. And so that kind of research is really one gene at a time. So this has only been fully explored in the CMYC case. And motivated by the fact that CMYC is so important uh, because of its cancer-causing characters. <laughs> <laughs>